This is StepiMed Insta Solutions Insta Question Biochemistry Question Number One. Forty-year-old male has complaints of bloated abdomen and diarrhea. On examination, signs of dehydration are noted. Vital signs are normal. This has happened as an episode that had occurred following a cheeseburger intake. The patient has reported prior episodes of similar nature following ingestion of a significant amount of dairy products. What is your diagnosis? A. Brucella infections. B. Salivary alpha amylase deficiency. C. Beta galactosidase deficiency. And D. Staph aureus food poisoning. Okay. Now, there is a very good chance that it can be confused as a food poisoning statement. People can think of both A. Brucella and D. Staphylococcus aureus because Brucella is an organism that can be transmitted through unpasteurized milk. The other organisms who can be transferred through unpasteurized milk can be Campylobacter jejuni and Mycobacterium bovis. But here in the question, we have dairy products. That is, we have converted the milk into milk products. It is no more unpasteurized. So, brucella cannot be the answer here. And please remember, Staph aureus, the most common source of food poisoning because of this organism would be dairy products. But what is not in favor of the answer being Staphylococcus aureus food poisoning? Because food poisoning should happen within six hours and they should have given a very clear mention about the time duration of onset of the diarrhea, nausea or vomiting. Now look at this. Here there is no nausea at all. They have not spoken about vomiting. Even if you leave this aside, think about it. It is not a single time episode. It has happened many times. And one of the episodes is clearly telling you that he will have such a kind of episode only when he is consuming significant amount of dairy products. On that basis, remember, dairy products contain lactose. And lactose, if it is not broken down by beta galactosidase enzyme, then the lactose will start accumulating in the colon. And in the colon, when the lactose is being acted upon by the bacteria, it goes for fermentation that produces gas and acid. This gas will make you feel like you have a bloated abdomen. And all these things are because of deficiencies of beta galactose days, right? This is called as lactose intolerance. And this can generally be very serious in case of children. And please remember, sometimes the children can actually be suffering less. As they become older, the suffering becomes even huge because the slowing and the decrease in the number of enzymes present in the G epithelial cells. Your salivary alpha amylase is not the point of concern here because alpha amylase is important for breaking the starch at the level of oral digestion. So the right answer would be beta galactosidase deficiency. Thank you. Hello people, this is Tupaymet, Insta Solutions, Insta Question, Biochemistry number 2. Which of the following has the strongest tendency to lose electrons? A. Cytochrome C. B. Flavin adenine dinucleotide. C. Nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. D. Oxygen. This question is based on the electron transport chain. Let me tell you how the electron transport chain has been fixed. If you think about the inner membrane of the mitochondria, you have complex 1, complex 3 and complex 4. 1, 3 and 4 as fixed complexes. Between complex 1 and 3, you will be having a floating complex called as CoQ. Between 3 and 4, there is one more floating complex called as cytochrome C. Here in this area, you will have a second complex also which can offer electrons. Now, if at all, NADH plus H plus is the one who is offering the electrons to the electron transport chain. Then the electrons will travel through the complex 1. They will go to the complex CoQ. Then they will go to complex 3. And then they will go to cytochrome C. And they will come to complex 4. And ultimately offer the electrons to the oxygen. Where oxygen is converted into water. Or if FADH2 is the one who provides electrons to the electron transport chain, then it will be skipping the complex 1. The electrons will travel from 2 to CoQ to complex 3 to cytochrome C and then to complex 4 and then to oxygen again producing water molecule. So my point here is electrons are traveling from either complex 1 to 2 to 4 through floating complexes or they will travel from 2 to 3 to 4 through floating complexes to reach ultimately oxygen. 
Here you have to understand the direction of the moment is decided by the rule that the electrons will always travel from a lower redox potential area to a higher redox potential area. So it means if it is NADH to begin with, then complex 1 is the first position where the electrons have reached. From there, they will try to reach oxygen ultimately. If FADH2 is offering the electron to the complex 2, from complex 2, the electrons are ultimately going to reach the oxygen. So here, oxygen has the highest redox potential and NADH or FADH2 will be having the least oxidative potential. And what exactly is the redox potential referred to as? The redox potential speaks about the ability of that pair to accept electrons very efficiently. So when I say this area is a high redox potential area, it means oxygen has the strongest tendency of gaining the electrons. That makes NADH or FADH2 as the strongest tendency to lose electrons. So here NADH has the strongest tendency of losing electrons closely followed by FADH2 and then comes cytochrome C between that of complex 3 and complex 4 and ultimately the one who will not be able to lose a lot of electrons would be oxygen because oxygen has the strongest tendency of accepting electrons. So the answer here would be option C followed by option B, then followed by option A, ultimately you go to oxygen. But the best answer is always option C. Thank you. Hello people, this is Stupaiman. Insta solutions, insta question in biochemistry number 3. Pick the true statement among the given statements with respect to the peptide chain. Met, gly, glue, cis, Liu, Lis, Cell and A. The peptide contains glutamine. B. The peptide contains a side chain with a secondary amino group. C. The peptide has a side chain that cannot be phosphorylated. D. The peptide cannot form an internal disulfide bond. They ask you to pick up the true statement here. Now look at what you are having here. Methionine is a sulfur containing amino acid where the sulfur is hidden. Glycine is the simplest amino acid. Glutamic acid is an acidic amino acid which is a charged amino acid. Cysteine is also a sulfur containing amino acid but here the sulfur is free for chemical activity. We have leucine and lysine. We have serine. Lysine is a basic amino acid and serine is a hydroxy group containing amino acid. Now let's start with option A. The peptide contains glutamine is a wrong statement because glutamine is denoted as GLN. GLU speaks about glutamic acid while glutamine is a neutral amino acid. Glutamic acid is an acidic amino acid. So option A is wrong. Option B, the peptide contains a side chain with a secondary amino group. The secondary amino group belongs to the amino acid called as prolin and this prolin is not present in your side chain or in the peptide chain. So option B is also wrong. C, the peptide has a side chain that cannot be phosphorylated. That is actually a false statement. Because you understand that serine is a hydroxy group containing amino acid. At this point, hydroxy group is capable of accepting a phosphate so that it can be phosphorylated. So option C is also wrong. Option D, the peptide cannot form an internal disulfide bond. That is also wrong because we have cysteine where SH group can be formed and that SH group can be made to link with another SH group from a corresponding cysteine residue. But here, when I say internal disulfide bond, it is not possible because within the chain, there is no other amino acid which is a repetition of cysteine. So here, cysteine is capable of forming a disulfide bond with another cysteine, but internally in this given peptide chain, it cannot be formed. So option D is the true statement. I repeat, cysteine can form disulfide linkages in internal disulfide linkages also, only if there is one more cysteine residue in the chain. Here there is no more cysteine residue in the chain, so internal disulfide bond formation is difficult. Cysteine can bring an SH group, another cysteine can bring in an SH group and the both SH groups can lose hydrogen to form cysteine with a disulfide linkage which is referred to as cysteine linkage. In this given peptide chain, it is not possible, so option D is a true statement. Hello people, this is Stupire Med, Insta Solutions, Insta Question, Biochemistry Question number 4. A drug X was given to a patient after which he went into metabolic acidosis. On arterial blood gas analysis, the pH value came up as 7. The pKa value of the drug X is 5. Considering that the X is a highly ionizable drug, what is the ratio of ionized versus non-ionized form of X? Is it A, 100, B, 10,000, C? 
100,000 T, 1,000,000. ,000. Okay. How do we approach this question first place? We go back to our basics. We have Henderson's Hasselbalch equation, which is pH is equal to pKa plus logarithm of H plus divided by H 